We are about to turn on the interpretation function. When we do, you will see a globe at the bottom of your Click on it and you will see options for English, Spanish, Hindi, and French. Choose your language. And I'll ask the interpreters to please repeat what I've just said in Hindi, French, and Spanish now. Sabko namaste. Aaj ke webinar mein anuvaat uplapt hai. और ये हिंदी स्पेनिश और फ्रेंच भाषा में उपलब्ध है थोड़ी ही देर में जब हम इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑन करेंगे तो आपके स्क्रीन पर एक ग्लोब का बटन आएगा उसे क्लिक करके आप अपनी भाषा का चुनाव कर सकते हैं बोंजोर टू ले मोंड डिसी पे ऑन वा अलूमे लिंटरप्रिटेशन सुर जूम ऑन वू डिमांड डाले सुर ला बार की वू ट्रोवे ऑन बा Vous allez trouver une globe et là, vous allez cliquer pour choisir votre langue de préférence. Vous pouvez choisir entre l'anglais, le français, l'espagnol et l'hindi. Et une fois commencé l'interprétation, vous allez entrer dans la salle de la langue de votre préférence. Merci beaucoup. Buenos días a todos. Este evento incluye el servicio de interpretación simultánea. Pulse sobre el globo que aparece en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Luego, seleccione su preferencia de idioma entre español, francés o hindi. Si tuviera algún problema referente a esta interpretación, envíe un correo electrónico a scollado.ajws.org. A jws.org. Gracias. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to this very auspicious date for our webinar, 2-2-22. I know it's going to be a wonderful event. Um, welcome on behalf of the Sexuality and Child Marriage Working Group. Our event today promises to be a lively discussion of how we think about success in our efforts to end child marriage and support girls. We encourage you to use the question and answer uh, function and the chat box, and we'll be noting your questions and taking them later in the session. So please do communicate with us through this through this way. Age at Marriage, uh, uh, my name is Margaret Green um, of Greenworks, and I'll be facilitating uh, today's webinar. Age at Marriage is a limited measure of success, and today we'll be hearing the perspectives of researchers, implementers, and a donor about what can be done to enrich the way we think about and measure success. The Sexuality and Child, Child Marriage Working Group, which organized this, this event, is made up of 16 main member organizations, along with several collaborating partners, working at the national and global levels to increase support for interventions that address the root causes of child early and forced marriages and unions. In particular, the norms around gender and sexuality that drive societal control of women's and girls' bodies and life choices, including the choice of whether, when, and whom to marry. In recent years, a number of groups of researchers have tried to assess the most valuable areas in which to invest. Their answers have been very diverse. Um, Lee Reif and colleagues found that programs offering incentives and attempting to empower girls can be effective in preventing child marriage and can foster change relatively quickly. Calamar and colleagues found a wide range of high quality, impactful interventions. Che and Yo found that interventions incorporating an empowerment approach either as the sole focus or in conjunction with another approach were the most successful in reducing child marriage. And most recently, Malhotra and El Nakab's systematic review highlights interventions that support girls' schooling through cash or in-kind transfers. They conclude that the enhancement of girls' own human capital and their opportunities through these single component interventions is the most compelling pathway. And they question the low rates of success, challenges to scale up, and the sustainability of multi component programs. So, this emphasis on the 
in the in the most recent systematic review on single component interventions, especially cash transfers, didn't make sense to many of us because child marriage is itself such a complex phenomenon and needs to be, we know uh, that it needs to be addressed from different angles. And we were disappointed by the way the study questioned multi-component multi programs. So in September of last year, some members of the working group published a letter to the editor of the Journal of Adolescent Health in response to the Malhotra and El Nakib review. The letter followed a commentary by um, authors Chandra Muli and um, Marina Plessens, uh, who, who, which were also written in response to the systematic review. And the working group raised a number of questions about the review. The problem um, highlighted uh, most strongly in the letter was the limitation of evaluating child marriage programs solely on the basis of whether they succeed in delaying girls' marriage to 18 or after, to or after age 18. This limited measure of success leads to potentially misleading conclusions, as has been pointed out in um, evalu some evaluations of conditional cash transfer programs. And I'm thinking of the research by Nanda and colleagues in India, where a narrow focus on delaying age at marriage misses out on the failures of some programs to change other aspects of girls' lives more broadly. Um, so this narrow focus on delaying age at marriage without addressing norms is potentially harmful, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that from our speakers. The focus on age 18 at the expense of other critical metrics is not limited to this one study. It's representative of a narrow and um, what we see as a somewhat unambitious approach to child marriage, which is really the norm in our field. And we'll be asking all of today's speakers to talk about how their work um, reinforces uh, the need to focus on things beyond age or in addition to age. So with us today are several people from various parts of the globe who work on the issue of child early and forced marriages and unions and adolescent girls' rights. Um, and they include, um, but are not limited to some members of the sexuality working group. And they're gonna discuss their views and experiences working on these issues. Again, please put your questions in the question and answer box and we'll get to as many of them as we can in just a little while. Uh, oh yes, and, and just to remind you that if you look at the globe at the bottom of the screen, you will be able to um, obtain interpretation in um, English, Hindi, French, and Spanish. So the first session of our, of our webinar today is with members of the sexuality working group who authored the letter to the, to the Journal of Adolescent Health. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Anna, Chima, and Aaron to please turn on your videos. Thank you so much. Um, so with us today, we have Anna Aguilera of Engender Health, Chima Izugbara of ICRW, and Aaron Murphy Graham of UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, other two other contributors to the letter were uh, our, our org organizer, Sarah Green of American Jewish World Service and me. Um, so here we're gonna talk, we're gonna hear a little bit about what inspired us to write this letter. Um, and the, the big overarching question for our conversation is, why is focusing only on delaying marriage until age 18 a limiting vision for programs to address child early and forced marriage and unions and a limiting metric for measuring program success? What should we be measuring instead? Um, so there's a good reason why age at marriage is such an appealing indicator. You know, compared to other possible measures of empowerment and change, it's relatively straightforward. It's clearly quantifiable. It answers the same question wherever you apply it. It can be aggregated over programs and geographies, 
patterns and, and power in large data sets, but it only tells us part of the story. And it's not always the part that we need to know the most about. So um, we want to be thinking a little bit more about measures that tell us about shifts in social norms and structures, increases in girls' agency, choice, and autonomy. Did she just marry later or did the underlying causes of child marriage that also negatively affect all aspects of women's and girls' lives also change? So we're, we're looking for greater, um, greater nuance and um, we want to ask ourselves what kinds of things should be measured and who's measuring them um, now? What do we know about alternative measures? So um, I, as we uh, turn to our speakers, I want to remind you, dear speakers, to speak slowly for the interpreters. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Anna. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your take and your interpretation of the focus on age at marriage. Thank you, Meg, and happy to be here with all of you today. You know, for me, child marriage is a manifestation of gender inequality, right? Patriarchal and social hierarchy that underpin the social norms that drive society's desire fundamentally to control girl and women's bodies. And more specifically for me, it's about sexuality. And I think sexuality is fundamentally at the core of this discussion and sometimes gets missed out. You know, based on my lived experience and the programming that Engender Health does and engages in, we know that these dynamics really manifest themselves quite differently in different contexts. But we also know that there is a common thread. And that common thread is that in many cases, girls are being pushed into marriage or unions in an effort to protect them. And it could be protecting them from things like sexual violence or from becoming a single adolescent mother or protecting them perhaps from the shame or the stigma that they may encounter if they do not marry as virgins. And young people are even oftentimes can be pushed into choosing marriage as it may be the only way to engage um, in a sexual and romantic relationship in their context. So I think all of these factors really drive many girls into early marriage and the norms that underpin these factors don't just magically disappear when an, a girl turns 18, whether she's married or not. For a girl who gets married at 16 or 17 or 19, all of these forces that limit her bodily autonomy, her sexuality, her agency, and her choice don't go away. And they're deeply embedded in our social norms that reinforce the idea that girls and women are unequal and inferior. And that is why for me, evaluating child marriage programs um, based primarily on whether they succeed in delaying girls' age of marriage to or after 18 is quite problematic. You know, for me, the end goal should be to challenge and transform unequal norms and focus on this longer term gender transformative change, like increasing girls' agency and opportunity and decision-making ability over all aspects of their lives, including sexuality, and including their decision to marry. And I think these are the outcomes that we should care more about and those that we should be carefully documenting and investing time and resources in. Because for me, the end goal of this work really is to support the rights of all and to achieve gender equality. And so a reductive messaging and a narrow focus on age of 18 as this primary, yay, we did it, uh, is not only superficial, but harmful. And to go back to your point earlier, yes, it's, it's more complex. And yes, it may be harder to do, but this is complex. It is multidimensional and it requires us to go beyond trying to find this one silver bullet strategy that's gonna fix it all because it really doesn't exist. So, you know, for me, that's really what it comes down to and sexuality is at the core of this conversation. 
uh, pass it back over to you, Meg. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And now, uh, Chima, I wanted to follow up on this idea that Anna has raised about the challenges girls are facing as conditioning the decision about marriage. Are we just evaluating programmatic approaches that are easy to evaluate? Uh, are we failing to address or to capture some of the things that we really need to be thinking about? Thanks very much, uh, Margaret. I hope uh, people can hear me well. Um, I think it's both of, uh, um, uh, it is, you know, um, largely uh, all of uh, the points that you raised. But before I come to the points, the, the question you asked in specific terms, I, I just want to, you know, tell people uh, here a story um, about my grandmother. Um, this happened many years ago. Um, my grandmother told me that she actually married roughly when she was 10 or, or 11. And, 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 that's, and that's the truth. By the time she married my grandfather, who was her last husband, um, she already had married four other men during that process. And this story is very important to the issues that we are raising uh, today. So on the morning after her fourth marriage, um, she woke up and found that uh, this new husband of, of hers had taken a colorful wrapper that her mother gave her as a gift and had tied it around his waist. Um, so my grandmother uh, said she was angry. She did not understand why her husband would take the wrapper that she got as a gift from her own mother and was tying it around her waist. She could not make sense of that then. And then she ran to the man, tore the, the wrapper from his waist, and then ran out of the compound and ran to her father, to her father's house, which was just a nearby village uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the community. So when she got back, when she got home to her parents, they received her back. And then her father told everybody that she, she needed more time uh, to understand what marriage was uh, or what marriage is, and that nobody should bother her with marriage again. So my grandmother said that she stayed in her father's house for five more, four to four, five, five more years, before she ultimately got married to my grandfather. And that during that process, many suitors actually came to her seeking her hand in marriage. And that uh, uh, when she refused any of them, her parents would support her uh, in that decision. And that uh, ultimately she actually made the choice to marry my grandfather. And it was not by anybody's, uh, uh, it was not anybody's decision, but a decision that she made. My grandmother would be 100 years today if she was alive, uh, because I think uh, from, from uh, the things we figured out, you know, um, you know she, she, she would be 100 years uh, in 2022. But her experience, uh, in my thinking, is related to the points we are discussing today. What is it that constitutes success in the prevention of child marriage? How should we judge interventions? How should we assess the sources of interventions? that seek to prevent child marriage? Should we simply be focusing on age? So I want to build on the point that Anna made to say that uh, I also disagree, um, that hinging the sources of uh, all child marriage prevention efforts on just delaying the age at which people marry is both problematic and unreasonable. It is also ineffective and could be potentially harmful. It defeats the purpose of all the efforts and programs and interventions that we make to ensure the empowerment of girls with skills for long life development and, the, and, the, and survival. Uh, in the context where I have worked, and many of you will also have very similar experiences, there are just many underlying issues that girls face that have implications and all that connect with the issue of child marriage. Yes, in, my, in the places I have worked, uh, they struggle with issues around the capacity to make decisions. They struggle with issues around the need for them to understand the forces at work in their lives. They struggle with issues about skills uh, for a life of independence and a life of autonomy. Many of them need to expand their networks and opportunities. Many of them also have major, major needs for higher education. So why interventions might delay the age at which this people marry, it does not 
while intervention shows my delay, you know, the age at which young people marry to 18, those interventions might not succeed um, in, terms of underlying, uh, in terms of dealing with the underlying factors and issues that girls face uh, uh, in, in their lives. So age is important. We all know that. Age is very, very important. But to reduce that lo the whole logic of the child prevention work to just age is all thinking. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, and dangerous, and we have made that point in, the, in, the, in, the, in our response, uh, in our letter to the editor of the Journal of Adolescent uh, Health. Um, you know, just to, just to go back to the point I, I made about skills, uh, there are many skills and competencies that girls you know, need to build a very successful life. You know, many of these skills may not be acquired, and we know they're acquired by age 18, and we know about that. Um, so, interventions that do not seek to build out these skills, ensure that girls have education, have the capacity to, you know, um, you know, live independent lives, have autonomy, autonomy, uh, might not be delivering, uh, in our own assumption, and in, based on my experience, the right impact on the lives of, of girls. So, in our response to the paper by Mahotra and the Enaki, we specifically, specifically took issues with uh, cash transfers, you know, because I mean, they are popular, they are being used widely, people celebrate them and all that. Of course, we know that, you know, you can use financial incentives to, you know, um, help families to not marry their guests before age 18, you know, and sometimes, and in many instances, you know, that those, you know, those interventions have worked. But if you want to maximize the benefits of these delays, if you want to maximize, you know, the, the opportunities, you know, to support girls to build out the skills, uh, the competencies they require, you know, to live, uh, to live uh, productive lives, interventions need to also be able to build the capacity of girls to choose. When right. to, if they marry, you know, uh, and, they, and, they, uh, and they, you know, whether they also want to have children uh, and all that. Great, you know, thank you. Oh, sorry, may, may I interrupt? Because I think that you've laid out some really important um, details about how we need to be ambitious in the interventions we're implementing and to be trying to build those skills and not simply delay to age 18. But another part of the problem is how these interventions are evaluated. And so I wanted to ask Erin to share some of her thoughts about the evaluation issues. Thank you, Chima. Thank you so much to all of the previous speakers and also to all those who've participated in the discussions leading up to writing the letter that we sent to the Journal of Adolescent Health, as well as to those who've been involved in planning this webinar. I also want to thank our interpreters today and to all of you for coming. So I wanted to emphasize the idea that using age of marriage as an indicator might be useful for many reasons, which Meg has already mentioned. It's easily quantifiable. It answers the same question in different contexts. It can be aggregated. But I want us all this morning, for me in California, morning for all of you in different time zones, um, I want to emphasize that um, we have to think about how this is an indicator conceptualized within the sustainable development goals. So let's just recall that the wording of the sustainable development goal is that we are attempting to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And the target is to eliminate all harmful practices such as child early and forced marriage and female genital mutilation. So I want to propose an analogy that might be overly simplistic, but that I still find useful. Let's use the analogy of the human body. And in fact, I think that the human body is a great analogy for society. When a body has a fever, it's an indication that something is wrong. Most likely there's an infection or some other illness. So if we only treat this fever or think of eliminating the fever as the goal of our interventions, we miss the underlying causes of the fever. We're not treating the infection. And I think of child marriage is very, it could be very similar to a fever. Well, of course we want to see the fever come down. We also want to make sure that we have a holistic approach. So this is an indicator, it's not an end goal. And I think 
In fact, um, this is one of the challenges of evaluation. If we think of child marriage as a symptom or manifestation of the underlying problems of gender inequality, violence against girls and women, harmful gender norms, and poverty, this shifts our gaze in terms of what we might look like in evaluating interventions and policies. And that's why this is so important when we think about evaluation, that in, in addition to considering the question of whether or not we've brought down the fever, we want to make sure that the body of humankind is doing well. So if we have a high rates of child marriage, we know that we're not advancing towards this overall goal of gender equality and empowering all girls and women. So evaluations need to consider the ways in which the underlying causes of early marriage can be addressed. And these have been well articulated by many of the groups that are present here today. And there's been a great amount of progress in better understanding pathways and mechanisms of interest in the past two decades. These are include agency, social norm change, empowerment, and structural shifts. And these are, of course, much more complicated to measure than age. But luckily, there are some fantastic scholars and organizations working on this. So one example is that Seema Jayachandran of Northwestern University has recently published a working paper that's called Using Machine Learning and Qualitative Interviews to Design a Five-Question Survey Module for Women's Agency. So next week in a talk at UC Berkeley, uh, she will be giving, it, she'll uh, present this paper and we will uh, paste a link in the chat for anyone who might be interested in attending. So in the interest of time, I'll just articulate as strongly as possible I can two closing points. I want to echo the words of Dr. Chandramoli and Plessens, who wrote a brilliant editorial in response to this systematic review. They say that it is too early to change the entire orientation of programming for child marriage prevention. We need more research to unplack the influence of implementation and evaluation challenges on the effectiveness of various interventions and intervention packages. So in short, we don't yet have all the information that we need, particularly when it comes to multi-component interventions designed to address the multifaceted issues that drive child marriage. Chima has already spoken about conditional cash transfers, and we know that poverty alleviation will be key. I think this goes without saying, but with regards to schooling and education, um, as someone who is situated within a school of education and has worked in the field of education for many years, um, we have been saying that schooling alone cannot address these underlying issues that cause child marriage. There may be a protective role that schools can play. Um, and if the girls are in school, they may be protected from marriage in certain contexts. But what we have seen in Latin America is that while rates of secondary school participation have expanded over time, very little change has taken place in terms of rates of early unions and early pregnancies. And this is because schooling needs to explicitly address gender norms, the lack of knowledge about sex and sexuality, and in general, to teach youth how to think critically. And unfortunately, we know aligned with SDG 4 on quality education, that we also have to work on improving the quality of education. Quality in education is empowering education, it is gender transformative education. So I would like to see more efforts to work directly with formal school systems to incorporate comprehensive sexuality education into the curriculum. And this will not be an easy task. So in closing, none of this will be easy to evaluate. We need donors to step up to fund research and interventions, but we should not shy away from these challenges. Let's not be satisfied with taking aspirin when we should be treating the disease and not the symptom. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And I think your analogy is something that will stick with people after, after today's webinar. Um, thank you, Anna, Chima, and Erin for your, for your thoughtful remarks. Um, as I mentioned before, some new measures of success in addition to agent marriage bode well for the field. And I think a number of people are trying out um, measures that have to do with the decision-making process and um, violence and um, the kinds of skills um, that uh, Chima mentioned and so on. So 
all of the things that you've said today have clarified for us the need to identify additional measures of success to reinforce the practical yet limited marriage before or after age 18. So thank you again for your research perspective on these questions. So now I'm going to ask you, Anna, Chima, and Aaron off, and Eugenia, Aisa, Cynthia, Yogesh, and Sheena, please to turn your cameras on. And to all of you, again, um, there's translation uh, at the bottom of the screen where it says interpretation under the globe. And please put your questions and comments in the question and answer um, for us to return to later on. And, and don't worry, the, the uh, questions that are being shared in the chat box are also being um, you know, curated for, for, the, for the question and answer session. So now we're going to turn to five practitioners and advocates from regional, national, and local grassroots organizations from Pakistan, Colombia, India, Cameroon, and the Dominican Republic. So you have shared with us that in your work with and for girls, age at marriage is not your main focus or vision of success. What we want to know is why is this the case and what are you focusing on instead? Now for everybody, uh, some of our speakers are going to be sharing with us in English, Spanish, Hindi, and French. So speakers, please speak slowly with compassion for the interpreters who are relaying translation into English and then into other languages. And audience, please, please tune into that interpretation. Eugenia Lopez Uribe is the regional coordinator of IPPF Western Hemisphere Region. Eugenia, can you please talk about what success should look like at the policy and advocacy level? How does a focus on age at marriage affect advocacy and what changes are we hoping for in girls' lives from your perspective? Thank you, Margaret. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Eh, bueno, primero quiero decir que para nosotros eh, y nosotres desde IPPF, que somos un movimiento a favor de la autonomía y el Despacio, derecho de las... por favor. Perdón. <laughs> que somos un movimiento a favor de la autonomía y el derecho de las personas para tomar sus propias decisiones, esta conversación es muy importante, ¿no? Eh, creemos que enfocarse en una medida única de éxito es peligroso porque nos trae el riesgo de ignorar el ecosistema más amplio de factores sociales que son los que en realidad están sosteniendo esta práctica discriminatoria y de violencia de género, como es el matrimonio infantil y los matrimonios forzados. ¿no? Eh, también creemos que estos factores se determinan con otras condiciones en la vida de las niñas y de las adolescentes, como cuáles son sus medios de vida, la posibilidad de educarse, de mantener relaciones placenteras y consensuadas en el futuro. Eh, es muy importante también por eso diferenciar eh, los diferentes componentes del acrónimo que siempre usamos de matrimonios y uniones infantiles, tempranas y forzadas, porque cada uno de esos elementos se relaciona con diferentes contextos y con diferentes prácticas. Eh, como, como comentaban en el panel anterior, identificamos que el matrimonio infantil es una expresión del sistema patriarcal pero también es una oportunidad eh, esta agenda para abordar las necesidades específicas de las adolescentes y asegurar su desarrollo. Si nosotros seguimos manteniendo una visión reduccionista que solo se concentra en la edad, estamos traicionando el movimiento que queremos fortalecer y les estamos fallando a las niñas y a las adolescentes y además a las jóvenes y a las mujeres que se unieron antes de los 18 años. Si reducimos la perspectiva de los programas y políticas a la edad de matrimonio, estamos asumiendo que tener los 18 años es el elemento que determina la autonomía de las niñas y de las adolescentes o que es lo que va a garantizar que un matrimonio es deseado y que es libre de violencia. Recordemos que simplemente el UFPA ha reconocido que hay una gran proporción de mujeres que no podemos decidir ya que estamos unidas sobre nuestra sexualidad y nuestra reproducción después de los 18 años. ¿no? 
Eh, los 18 años son un cálculo legal que no considera necesariamente la agencia bajo las propias condiciones y los contextos. Entonces es muy importante que nuestro trabajo sea volver a colocar la autonomía como el elemento prioritario en el diseño de programas y defenderla con la importancia que se merece. Realmente no queremos adolescentes que se casen dos días después de cumplir los 18 años. Lo que queremos son niñas y adolescentes que tengan las herramientas y las capacidades para decidir cuándo, cómo, con quién y si quieren casarse. Y también queremos intervenciones que respondan a las necesidades de las mujeres a lo largo del ciclo de vida, antes y después de unirse, y que las acompañen en las decisiones sobre su sexualidad y reproducción, pero también sobre su educación, sus oportunidades económicas e incluso su participación política. Tener metas es muy importante, pero los, los números no pueden ser el fin de la incidencia. El fin de la incidencia es garantizar la dignidad y el bienestar de las personas. Y para eso necesitamos transformar las estructuras de poder y la inequidad que afecta a las niñas, a las adolescentes y a las mujeres que están en su diversidad y que pueden o no querer entrar a una unión o a un matrimonio. Ellas son las que deben estar al centro y la, y la incidencia que hacemos tiene que tener ese rostro humano. En, en concreto, mi llamado es a fortalecer la inversión y el protagonismo de las organizaciones y los movimientos de base comunica, comunitaria, especialmente de las adolescentes. Y aquí es donde necesitamos tener metas muy claras. Porcentajes de participación de adolescentes y jóvenes y presupuesto etiquetado. Tenemos que diseñar para aprender a través del tiempo y son las adolescentes las que nos tienen que decir cómo ven ellas el éxito. ¿Cómo quieren que nosotras midamos el éxito? Porque es en sus vidas en donde queremos incidir. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Eugenia. Now I'd like to turn to Yogesh Vaishnav, who works with Vikalp Sanstan in Rajasthan. Yogesh, you have shared with us that child marriage is very common in Rajasthan where you work. In that case, what does success look like when so many girls are, are married, and what is Vikalp doing on the topic of early marriage? Thank you, Meg. Uh, main Hindi mein apni baat, uh, chaunga, jaysa ki Meg ne ki mera naam Yogesh hai, aur main Vikalp sanstan ki shuruwaat se juda hoon. Vikalp asal mein gender adharit hinsa ko khatam karne ke liye yuwaon ke saath milkar kaam kar raha hai, aur balwa humare kaam ka ek mukhi hissa shuruwaat se hi raha hai. और हमारा मानना है कि उम्र का जो आंकड़ा है वो कोई मैजिक नंबर नहीं हो सकता 18 साल की लड़की होते ही अचानक से सारी समझ आ जाएगी ऐसा नहीं होता नेशनल फैमिली हेल्थ सर्वे ने अभी बताया है कि आज भी चार में से एक लड़की का बालवा हो रहा है और अभी भी भारत बाल वधुओं का एक देश कहलाता है यानी कि बहुत ज्यादा बड़ी संख्या में यहां पर चाइल्ड मैरिज है विकल्प शिक्षा से ड्रॉप आउट और बालवा की रिस्क वाली लड़कियों के सशक्तिकरण शिक्षा स्पोर्ट्स को ज्यादा महत्व देता है जिससे वो अपने राइट्स चॉइस और निर्णय को ले सके जरूरी है I wanted to somebody has raised a um, technical issue with the translation that the Hindi is audible over the translation and I want to it's working now okay sorry please go ahead तो so, मैं कह रहा था कि जरूरी है कि नेगोशिएशन स्किल हो कॉन्फिडेंस हो एजुकेशन पूरी कर सके वो अपने सपने पूरी कर सके अपनी पसंद का कैरियर चुन सके शादी कब करनी है किससे करनी है या नहीं करनी है तो ये चुनने की आजादी उसको हो इसलिए विकल्प स्टीरियोटाइप सोशल नॉर्म को चुनौती देने और लड़कियों के सकारात्मक वातावरण बनाने का काम करता है साथ ही जेंडर ट्रांसफॉर्मेटिव अप्रोच को अपने काम का केंद्र मानता है एक दूसरा आधार है कि लड़कों और पुरुषों के साथ यौनिकता और मर्दानगी के मुद्दे पर काम करता है इस पूरे काम में एक जरूरी बात समझ में आई कि जिन लड़कियों की शादी हो जाती है वो ज्यादा वनरेबल है वो ज्यादा हिंसा का सामना कर रही है वो पूरी तरह से शिक्षा से वंचित है वो प्रजनन स्वास्थ्य और यौनिकता हिंसा से जुड़े मुद्दों के साथ बहुत जूझती है ऐसी शा, लाखों शादीशुदा लड़कियां हैं जो मुख्य धारा से गायब है यानी कि मैं कहूंगा कि सोशल सेक्टर के काम से इनविजिबल है 
एक उदाहरण देना चाहूंगा कि हम जब शादीशुदा लड़कियों की एक बैठक कर रहे थे और उसमें हमने पूछा उनके सपनों के बारे में तो एक लड़की ने जवाब दिया अब हम कैसे सपने देख सकते हैं हम तो हमारी सास और पति जो कहेगा वही करना होगा उनकी परमिशन के बिना हम हमारे माता पिता के यहाँ भी नहीं जा सकते हम शादीशुदा हैं हमारी शिक्षा हमारे सपने अब हमारे हाथ में नहीं है इसलिए हमारे पास कोई सपना नहीं है ये बात सुनने के बाद हमने एक रिसर्च सोचा और एक रिसर्च किया उस रिसर्च में पाया कि 92 परसेंट लड़कियां बाद में शादी के बाद फॉर्मल एजुकेशन से पूरी तरह छूट गई करीब पिचासी प्रतिशत ने मिस कैरेज अबोशन रिपोर्ट किया ये रिसर्च की रिपोर्ट बताती है कि पचास से ज्यादा लड़कियों की शादी चौदह साल से पहले ही हो गई थी ऐसे बहुत सारे परेशान करने वाले मुद्दे आंकड़े निकले इसी रिसर्च में हमने लड़कों को भी जोड़ा शादीशुदा लड़कों को और बहुत चौंकाने वाले आंकड़े निकल के आए जैसे कि बयासी प्रतिशत लड़कों ने कहा कि महिलाओं को परिवार के खातिर हिंसा सहन करना चाहिए लगभग आधे से ज्यादा लड़कों ने कहा कि प्रेग्नेंट होना ये औरतों की जिम्मेदारी है दोनों तरह के आंकड़ों से स्पष्ट हुआ कि असल में जल्द और बाल बाल लड़कियों की योनिकता को नियंत्रित करने यौन सुचिता बनाए रखने और उनके श्रम पर हिंसक नियंत्रण करने का हथियार है और यही मर्दाना सत्ता को बनाए रखने में सहायक होता है तो बाल विवाहित लड़कियों को शिक्षा जानकारी और सपनों या उनके नेटवर्क से वंचित रखा जाता है तो इसलिए असल में ये मुद्दा जेंडर आधारित गैर हिंसा गैर बराबरी और हिंसा के बीच में उलझा हुआ है ये सिर्फ उम्र पर फोकस करने से हल नहीं होने वाला इससे उभरने के लिए लंबे समय के इंटरवेंशन की जरूरत है ताकि लड़कियों को निर्णय लेने का अधिकार और एजेंसी मिल सके पितृ सत्ता और मर्दाना सोच मूल्यों और परंपरा को बदलने बदलकर जेंडर जस समाज की आवश्यकता है अपने को और युवा शादीशुदा लड़कियों के मुद्दों को विजिबल बनाने के लिए इन मुद्दों को मुख्य धारा में लाने की बहुत जरूरत है यह इनविजिबल पॉपुलेशन है सरकार संस्था और डोनर एजेंसी को इनसे जुड़े काम को डॉक्यूमेंटेशन को रिसर्च नीतियों पर इन्वेस्ट करने की जरूरत है असल में उम्र की बहस में इन शादीशुदा लड़कियों के इशू खो जाते हैं सो so, ये मेरी तरफ से अभी के लिए है थैंक यू सो मच that's that was wonderful thank you so much yogesh um your these remarks on the conditions faced by married girls are very uh insightful and a reminder to us that it's not just about age um now i want to turn to aisa ngatansu dumara who's the coordinator of the alliance for the elimination of violence against women in cameroon aisa you've told us about the context in cameroon with boko haram climate change and broad discrimination against girls and women and um you have your own personal and community experience with child marriage You told us that despite a law against early marriage, girls are still marrying as young as age 15 because of the influence of local culture. So what are you doing to address early marriage? What does success look like in your work? Yeah, merci Nick pour la parole donnée et bonsoir à à tous les autres collègues sur le panel. Euh, une intervention réussie pour nous euh, serait une intervention qui permet à la jeune fille euh, d'acquérir des compétences de vie, d'avoir des valeurs et des, 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 des notions de leadership, des compétences pour connaître son corps, sa sexualité, connaître ses droits. Et ça, nous le faisons à travers... Euh, Des, des actions que nous avons mises en œuvre depuis plusieurs décennies dans un contexte que vous avez déjà décrit. Et je fais mienne parce que la limite de l'âge, c'est dissuasif. C'est vrai, marquer un, une limite de 18 ans pour le mariage, c'est très dissuasif. Mais ce n'est pas suffisant. Comme le dit un sage, 18 ans, ce n'est pas suffisant et la loi à elle seule ne suffit pas ne suffit pas pour régler euh, la situation, pour permettre aux, aux jeunes femmes, aux jeunes filles qui rentrent dans des mariages après cet âge-là de, de s'accomplir. Donc, ce que nous faisons, c'est mettre en place des, des clubs de filles. Ce sont des espaces sains, des espaces sûrs où des jeunes filles et garçons. Parce que pour nous, le langage est important. C'est un club de filles, mais à l'intérieur, 
on pourrait rencontrer aussi des garçons. Parce qu'on doit leur apprendre la culture de la non-violence, du respect du libre arbitre de leurs soeurs, parce qu'ils doivent aussi se protéger les uns les autres. Donc, dans ces espaces qui sont des clubs de filles, à la fois, la petite fille reçoit euh, des informations, des attitudes, des connaissances sur ce qui sont ses, que, quels sont ses droits, la connaissance de son corps, et cela lui permet à elle de se positionner, de s'adresser à ses parents avec beaucoup d'assurance, parce qu'elle peut convaincre son parent de ne pas euh, la marier euh, contre sa volonté, quel que soit son âge. Parce que si elle ne connaît pas ses droits, elle ne peut rien dire. Et, et, et la conséquence du mariage précoce et forcé, ça suit une femme toute sa vie. Ça ne s'arrête pas seulement euh, lorsqu'elle se marie, mais ça la suit durant toute sa vie, voire jusqu'à la fin de ses jours, jusqu'à sa mort. Parce qu'elle va être une personne qui ne peut pas parler, qui ne peut pas décider d'elle-même, qui ne peut pas prendre une décision sur sa vie. Donc pour nous, les clubs de filles, c'est un espace vraiment au sein de l'école. À la fois, ça permet à la petite fille de rester plus longtemps à l'école. Parce que nos programmes permettent aussi de donner des micro-bourses aux petites filles pour les soutenir dans l'éducation, pour qu'elles restent plus longtemps à l'école. Mais pour nous, ce n'est pas le fait de rester à l'école qui suffit, mais c'est toutes les compétences qu'elle acquiert pendant la période où elle est dans ces espaces-là. Nous ne limitons pas nos actions à ce niveau. Il faut également des plaidoyers parce que ceux qui marient les filles, ce sont les parents, c'est les autorités traditionnelles, c'est toutes les autres personnes de la communauté. Donc, nous engageons également les autorités traditionnelles et religieuses à travers des plaidoyers pour que ceux-là comprennent que les, les, les droits humains sont des droits essentiels pour tous et qu'ils doivent protéger les filles leurs enfants, les filles et les garçons ont les mêmes droits. À la fois, nous avons aussi des programmes où on distribue des kits de dignité aux petites filles pour qu'elles apprennent à gérer leur menstruation. C'est des petites choses, mais c'est important pour renforcer la dignité, l'estime de soi. Donc, tous ces éléments-là permettent d'avoir un programme réussi. Et si nous devons euh, adresser euh, une demande à ceux qui nous écoutent, nous pensons qu'il faut mettre l'accent sur l'autonomisation, comme l'a dit mes prédécesseurs, sur l'autonomisation des filles de manière complète, pas seulement au niveau économique, mais en leur permettant d'acquérir les droits, d'acquérir, de, de réaliser leurs besoins pratiques, mais également d'atteindre de de, leurs droits, les droits sexuels et reproductif parce que le, la sexualité de la fille, c'est ça qui la conduit dans des situations de mariage pour les s'efforcer. Donc, je pense que c'est ça la stratégie que, que nous avons mise en, en place et qui permet d'avoir des résultats malgré le contexte, malgré les pesanteurs socioculturels et autres. Euh, je ne vais pas monopoliser la parole, je vais vous la renvoyer. Merci, Meg, pour la parole. Merci, merci pour vos contr contributions. Thank you for sharing uh, concrete ideas about how efforts to respond to child marriage can go beyond focusing on delaying age at marriage. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask Cynthia, um, the director of La Ceiba in the Dominican Republic, to talk about, um, well, we know that child marriage is often completely invisible in Latin America and the Caribbean, in part because so many girls are entering informal unions. Although in many cases that, the, that decision is driven by the same factors that lead girls to marry early in other settings. If these unions are often temporary, how do you respond? How do you measure the success of your work with girls? Bien, uno de los aspectos a los que respondemos dentro de nuestro trabajo con niñas, adolescentes y jóvenes son que las uniones en nuestro, en el, en nuestro contexto son temporales. Esto más o menos abarca un plazo de un año y medio a dos años. Y este factor, digamos, específico, contextual en el que estamos está relacionado con la edad de las uniones que para el caso de las mujeres es, digamos, la adolescencia, el periodo de la adolescencia, y en el caso de los hombres de la adulta juventud. 
así digamos que, que ambas personas están transitando por un ciclo de vida en el que se, pre, se presuponen eh, cambios de intereses y cambios de prioridades, vamos a decir, de manera natural. Así las, las adolescentes se unen con sus novios como una continuación esperada de una relación estable, que a las chicas les, les significa movilidad social, validación comunitaria y el ejercicio de una sexualidad con menos estigma. Esta temporalidad conlleva una complejidad más que se vincula con el embarazo, porque, digamos, a través de los levantamientos que otras compañeras y otras aliadas han hecho, podemos identificar que en nuestro contexto el embarazo no es la causa de la unión, el embarazo es un resultado de estar unida. Y en este contexto, digamos que cuando las, cuando las adolescentes salen de las uniones, salen con un factor, digamos, que puede tornarse en mayor vulnerabilidad, que es el cuidado y la manutención de hijos e hijas. Desde la CEIBA, pues compartimos con nuestras compañeras el análisis de las causas del matrimonio infantil y la unión forzada eh, que, que tenemos, digamos, a nivel global. Y a partir de nuestras condiciones contextuales, pues hemos dedicado nuestro trabajo a generar condiciones para el ejercicio de la agencia de las niñas, las adolescentes y las jóvenes como un elemento central en la toma de decisiones. Creemos que es necesario reposicionar el enfoque feminista que reconoce que todas las mujeres tienen derecho a la libre determinación y que este derecho está directamente relacionado con las condiciones en las que nacemos, crecemos y nos desarrollamos. Nos interesa que las adolescentes con las que trabajamos sean capaces de mirar que tienen múltiples alternativas para enfrentar la violencia y la exclusión y que en todo caso el matrimonio infantil y la unión forzada es una respuesta falsa a una situación social muy compleja. ¿Qué alternativas les proponemos? Pues tal vez la más importante es no buscar esas soluciones solas y aisladas. Que, se re, que reconozcan que forman parte de una comunidad que las significa, que las valora y que las acompaña en el proceso de edificarse. Otro enfoque central de nuestro trabajo es cambiar el valor simbólico que tiene la sexualidad de las adolescentes, en el cual ellas sean capaces de ejercer una sexualidad plena y saludable que no las condene a unirse. Muchas veces nos han preguntado si nosotras promovemos la, la sexualidad de, de, de las adolescentes y nosotras creemos que la sexualidad no necesita promoción. Existe, está ahí y vivirla de manera placentera y saludable es un derecho. Consideramos necesario seguir trabajando en el impacto que tienen las uniones y los embarazos en las adolescentes en términos de inclusión social, ya que ninguno de los dos debería eh, significar en automático una barrera infranqueable para, la, para alcanzar la plenitud y el desarrollo. Desde la CEIBA seguimos discutiendo cuál es el éxito de nuestra acción, porque creemos que el gran éxito sería que ellas fueran capaces de tomar decisiones, reconociendo que ellas son las expertas de sus propias vidas. Pero estamos conscientes que algunas de estas decisiones no siempre van a ser coincidentes con lo que nosotras creemos por lo cual nos parece indispensable aportar capacidades para que las niñas, las adolescentes y las jóvenes se posicionen frente al matrimonio infantil y la unión forzada y temprana por convicción y no por ideología. Nuestro quehacer como organización comunitaria es en última instancia acompañar a las adolescentes frente al contexto en el que, se, en el que desarrollan su agencia, amplificar sus demandas de acceso a una educación de calidad, de educación integral en sexualidad, a acceder de, plen, de manera plena y oportuna a una amplia gama de, de metodologías anticonceptivas modernas y a poder tener un trabajo decente. Antes de terminar, quisiéramos apuntar que desde nuestra perspectiva existe un riesgo cuando nuestra medida de éxito es la prohibición del matrimonio antes de los 18 años, porque esta medida es una medida punitiva contra los hombres que vuelve a colocar en el centro de nuestro quehacer a los agresores y no a las niñas, las adolescentes y las jóvenes, en particular sus necesidades y sobre todo sus deseos 
qué es lo que debería ser nuestra prioridad. Muchas gracias. Very interesting and provocative, um, Cynthia. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was great. So now I would like to turn to Shina Hadi, who's the executive director of Ahong in Pakistan. Shina, you had mentioned your view that so much work with girls is informed by a limited public health perspective on age and child marriage. And I wondered if you could please um, elaborate on why you see that as a problem and what focus we should have instead. Thank you, Maggie. Um, yeah, so, you know, Ahang has been working on child early and forced marriage programs for over two decades. And I think one of the most significant learnings um, that I've had about sustainable change uh, in this area is um, that, you know, we can't always take the path of least resistance. And by that, I mean that most programs that I've seen in Pakistan use health-based arguments to challenge child early enforced marriage to convince stakeholders that marrying girls under the age of 18 leads to higher rates of mortality and morbidity and cycles of poverty. Um, and this argument faces less resistance overall. I, I can't argue with that. But the question is, does it really create meaningful social change? And from what I've seen, I would say not enough um, because we're not seeing those ground level changes that we would, we would really want to see by this point. Um, and, you know, by taking this sort of path of least resistance, I think we're missing out on supporting girls to identify their own needs, their own wants, um, which will allow them to navigate their own life choices and make informed reproductive health decisions. Because ultimately then what we do is go into programming that is about, well, why isn't contraceptive rates higher or why are STI rates like that? But it's all interconnected because we're not really building those skills from, from the ground uh, up. Um, and you know what we're also doing is really choosing to ignore that a malnourished girl above the age of 18 is equally susceptible to anemia and blood loss in pregnancy as an, an under 18 age girl or a girl who's socially or economically isolated and vulnerable is equally susceptible to violence as a girl who's under the age of 18. Um, and so in a way, the focus on age and, and emphasis on laws and policies um, as a solution to the issue is really denying uh, that a lot of what is perpetuating, which others have said as well, um, a lot of what is perpetuating the ongoing violation of girls' sexual rights is deep-rooted gender discrimination. And that has placed an economic and social value on the control of girls' bodies. Um, and challenging, you know, socially stigmatized norms is not easy. Uh, but I think it's critical if we're going to move forward towards programming that brings meaningful change for girls and, it's rights, and is rights-based and focused on real concepts of empowerment and agency. And um, I think those, those terms, empowerment and agency, also have started being used quite loosely. Um, what do we really mean when we ask for um, a girl to, to have, um, uh, you know, agency? What are, what are we really saying about that? How can programs support and facilitate empowerment and agency given the local context without putting girls in harm's way or marginalizing them further? Because um, we need to be cognizant of attacking important social pillars for girls, such as marriage, without having other avenues and support systems in place for them, because that can do harm. And we, we don't want um, that in our programming either. Um, and for this, you know, so what's the solution? I think what we really need to do is look at localizing program interventions, looking at building strong foundations that give girls a sense of self-worth, help them to be able to negotiate and make decisions, seek help um, and understand and develop ownership of their own bodies, even going down to understanding puberty, menstruation, menstrual health, those foundational issues, um, because these are, the, the, are what are gonna create the footing for meaningful change. Um, and to measure these programs, we can't look at age and policies alone. And I'll give an example from Pakistan. Um, in Pakistan, in the province of Sindh, uh, in 2013, the age, the minimum age of marriage for girls was raised from 16 to 18 to meet um, the same as boys, which was 18 at the time. And what we've seen is, 
barely any impact at all. Girls can't access the law. They don't know about the law. Um, those with power are the ones who can access the law in, in most cases, in any case. So that law is actually being used against girls who are marrying of their own volition. Um, in fact, we only register 35% of births in Pakistan in the first place. So putting down a law about age is really just paying lip service to the issue because we don't know how old girls are in the first place. Um, so that's really not going to solve the problem. Um, instead, I think we need to be looking at investing in longer term community driven programs. They need to be designed with the input of girls' voices. Um, those voices need to be reflected in the program design uh, for it to really capture and, and, and measure change. Um, and, this, and this change can be measured in multiple ways. This can be done through looking at those indicators that tell us more about how girls make informed choices, what they use as their support systems, where they draw strength, and really looking at those girls that do challenge the status quo and gender norms where they pull that power from, where that comes from. I think that would be um, a far better measure um, uh, of change. And I know in, in Ahang's programs, we've had to test out many different methodologies of assessing impact for um, say our comprehensive sexuality education programs because agency and then the ripple effect of that agency on families and communities is really complicated to capture. Um, but very possible, I think if we import fewer ideas of success and focus more on what girls are telling us they need uh, to be able to thrive, not just live free of health complications. I think we need to set the bar a lot higher than that. I think I think girls deserve that. Thanks. Thank you, Sheena. And what an amazing collection of remarks. I, I can see from the chat box that others are similarly inspired by how Everything you've said is mutually reinforcing, but each of you has brought quite a distinctive perspective. Thank you so much for a, a really fantastic panel. Um, and now before we open it up to audience questions, um, we'd like to get perspective, one last perspective from a representative from a funding institution. So if the five of you, Eugenia, Aisa, Cynthia, Yogesh, and Sheena, would be so kind as to turn your cameras off, I'm going to ask Kathy Hall of the Summit Foundation to turn her camera on. Thank you, thank you. So we have um, with us Kathy Hall, who's um, the uh, program director for the Equality for Women and Girls program at the Summit Foundation. And um, I think that her Yes, there we go. Um, so Kathy, you, we've heard from researchers and we've heard from practitioners and thank you so much for being our, our, um, our representative donor. I know it's a lot of pressure, um, <laughs> but um, from the perspective of a funder, we'd love to hear your reflections on this issue, You know the kinds of things that you heard from speakers today and what role funders could play in supporting a more gender transformative approach to child early and forced marriages and unions. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. It is such a privilege to be here today. I really was, I've just been enjoying hearing every speaker's perspective. It's been so rich, uh, evaluators and researchers, and of course the implementers most importantly. So I work for a pretty small family foundation that has supported addressing child marriage, early and forced unions, in the region for about, in, sorry, in Central America for about 10 years. Kathy, We're a fairly small sorry, donor. Could I ask you, yes. sorry, um, just to speak a tiny bit more slowly? Sure, Thank you. sorry. So I would say on balance as a donor, we have probably neither a lot, any more constraints or less constraints than a really large donor, even though we are quite small. In my experience, regardless of the donor size, what really needs to be embedded from the start of a relationship that a donor has in its interest to support a project to address child marriage is to have a two-way dialogue with grantees from the outset. The donor has a checkbook, but they do not have all the answers. In fact, in my view, really donors are far less likely to have any answers at all compared to their grantees, compared to those that are implementing. 
So it really is best to establish that from the outset and to work through the challenges and the realities that both sides have. So, I mean, I really just hope that all of the donors that are listening to this or may listen later to the recording can try to internalize today's webinar as best you can. And to really communicate very clearly to all of your grantees and to most importantly to your leadership that age of marriage indicators as standalone markers of success are just insufficient and can be misleading, the premise of this webinar. But we really need to internalize then what we've heard about agency, empowerment, and choice in girls' and young women's lives and interrogate how each of us as a donor's representative can migrate that sort of reality that is there to our strategy. So, you know, if, you're, if your leadership is focused on moving the needle on age of marriage, and they well may be because we know it's an SDG indicator, um, it's our job as the program staff of a donor to insist that it's not an appropriate indicator of success to apply to implementing organizations. Um, you know, and I, I feel that, again, grantees can try to help this in the with, help with this in the dialogue to educate donors. I know that can be much easier said than done, but I do feel that, you know, I hope that we've entered a space and as donors of whatever size to have that kind of dialogue with those that we are considering funding or already funding. I feel that there's this other critical source of friction that um, sometimes just causes so much challenge between donors and grantees. And that is the fact that many times donors, including my own, have constraints internally about the grant period that they're able to support. And so, you know, what needs to happen is in this dialogue, I feel that donors need to really um, communicate with grantees about like, what is the time frame that's reasonable for support of this type of, of implementing a project? And the grantee also needs to communicate that. I mean, it really should be longer than the contractual peri period of a first grant. So in other words, most donors come forward and say, well, we have, we can do a one-year period. We can do a three-year period. Those are still far too short for the type of time period that we're talking about for this type of social change. And so I think just getting that clarity there, um, it's the donor representative's job to try to continue to advocate internally to continue the funding beyond, say, the initial grant period. Um, but again, that really also means that the grantees can help to um, arm their donor representative with the information about what they can show in that particular grant period. You know, that, they, that there are indicators, qualitative and quantitative indicators that don't have anything to do with age of marriage, but that are very important for showing agency, um, autonomy and choice. Um, it's, it's a work in progress, but that's still, that is evolving quickly. If there's one thing I hope perhaps the COVID pandemic has done, it's perhaps helped donors to be more flexible. Um, and as, it, as you know, there was sort of havoc that happened in programming. So what needs to happen now really, I think is for donors to keep working to translate that flexibility so that it isn't, it wasn't just during the pandemic, but that also is, um, you know, having flexibility to take on appropriate indicators that show empowerment as the SDGs really do say that it's not just um, the overall national indicator that should be decisive in, um, in showing whether programs are successful. So uh, in conclusion, I'll just say that this is certainly a journey for my foundation and, but we are a lot clearer that we want our grantees to define what they see as appropriate short and medium and longer term indicators of success. And uh, so I hope that all, all of you and all of us donors can, can try to you know, come together and really have that kind of ongoing dialogue to, to have much more benefit for the girls and young women that we know um, need support. So thank you. I think I'll stop there and, and Meg, let me know if you wanna chat a little bit more about anything that I've said. 
Thank you. Thank you. I know that um, a number of people in our audience will want to ask you questions. Um, so, but I, um, I, I really just wanted to express appreciation for your kind of rounding out the perspectives that we've shared today from programmers, researchers, and now a donor on the challenging issues related to how we think about and measure success in the context of child marriage. Um, so now we've finally arrived at the um, opportunity to respond to audience questions. Thank you everybody for your patience. Um, you've really made excellent use of the chat box and the question and answer function. Um, and we'll get to as many questions uh, as we can. So I'd like to invite all of our speakers to turn their videos back on and join the question and answer. I'm going to you know, cluster together and ask some questions that the audience has posed to us. And then I might call on one or two of you to lead with an answer. I do request, we have only 15 minutes left in the um, webinar and uh, I request that you um, respond briefly so that we have plenty of time to, to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and if you would like to respond to a particular question, you don't need to wait. You can just raise your hand and I'm very happy to call on you. Um, so the first question from Mabel Vanoranya is, um, what concrete suggestions do you have to address this challenge of norms and objectives uh, being so hard uh, to measure? Um, uh, is there anybody who would like to to start with that? We've we've heard about um, you know people are trying to or people are trying out measures like decision making or violence. Um, there's you know it's important to have theoretical frameworks that um, support the design of interventions that identify pathways for change. Um, Anna spoke about improving agency, autonomy, decision-making skills, Anna and, and others. Um, and so what, what is, would someone like to respond to this question about how it's, it's considerably more difficult to measure some of the um, uh, concepts and indicators that we're talking about than it is to measure age at marriage? What do you think we should be measuring concretely? Yes, Erin? Sure, thanks. I'm not a measurement expert, um, but I do think that what we measure should derive specifically from the contextually developed um, theory of change. So interventions often have a sort of a theory of change at their heart and at their core or pathways. Um, by which the um, folks who are working on this particular strategy to empower girls um, and to advance gender equality will, will, will identify what does a pathway look like in that particular context. And so I think that those measures and indicators need to be uh, reflective of the context and that there are some things that we have fo focused on, for example, gender norms, and there's been a great deal of advancement in terms of how do we conceptualize and me measure gender norms and also agency. Um, so I, I mentioned this uh, talk at UC Berkeley next week on measuring women's agency. I think there's also been advances on measuring agency. So I think the idea is that we need a number of indicators that we recognize might not be the final outcome of interest, but that we see as intermediary mm -hmm. measures that get us to, again, the overarching goal of women's empowerment and gender equality and changing these harmful gender norms and the underlying causes. And yes, right. it, that's one indicator, but we need others. Yes, yeah, so uh, measurements that are somewhere in between, uh, somewhere along the way are, are very important. Um, Cynthia, would you um, like to respond? Y muchas gracias. Bueno, en, desde la experiencia latinoamericana, creo que un insumo que, que está ahí para compartirse y para retomarse so, eh, son los indicadores generados por la Conferencia Regional de Población y Desarrollo, que tienen además como un capítulo muy específico sobre sexualidad en, en adolescentes y jóvenes, pero que bueno, que además esto nos permite también repensar el área de influencia que queremos como organizaciones. 
la, medir, por ejemplo, el, la disponibilidad de métodos anticonceptivos modernos, medir eh, los índices de violencia obstétrica que enfrentan niñas y adolescentes en el desarrollo de su reproducción, medir lo, la, o cuantificar los programas que se, de reincorporación de, de adolescentes embarazadas o unidas al, al sistema escolarizado, creo que son indicadores que nos podrían, que sobre todo creo que nos podrían enseñar la voluntad con la que se está abordando desde las entidades estatales. Después creo que están a lo mejor mediciones que las organizaciones podemos hacer como, la, como el uso del método anticonceptivo, ¿no? O sea, qué tanto las chicas refieren tener a disposición y utilizar un método anticonceptivo en su relación. Uh -huh. Que tanto tienen, por ejemplo, de capacidad de optar por, por otras acciones de desarrollo, como la participación en espacios culturales o deportivos. Como a partir de lo que ellas, o sea, de qué otras realmente oportunidades están descubriendo en su entorno. Creo que la uh -huh. medida, creo que la medida depende de quién mida, pero me parece que sí hay experiencias muy interesantes de, de cómo aproximarnos a esto. Thank you, thank you, Cynthia. Um, Eugenia, please, um, if you would respond, and then I'm going to go to the next I'm question. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, yo quisiera, eh, estaba muy en sintonía con lo que Cynthia dijo, eh, pero creo que es muy importante también salirnos de la caja de las mediciones que regularmente tenemos. Hay indicadores sobre felicidad, por ejemplo, que se están ahora ensayando en algunas áreas de Naciones Unidas, están los indicadores de desarrollo. Necesitamos aprender a hacer indicadores complejos que nos permitan identificar estos aspectos que Cintia estaba comentando. ¿Cómo vemos el desarrollo de oportunidades de educación? En, en Guatemala, regresando a, a la pregunta de, de la persona que pregunta en Guatemala, hay, hay actividad, hay intervenciones que han logrado que las adolescentes ya no se casen a los 18 años, pero las comunidades no tienen escuela. Entonces las adolescentes están adentro de las casas esperando a que pase el tiempo para poderse casar porque no tienen acceso a la escuela o a oportunidades económicas. Eso no es un indicador de éxito. Entonces necesitamos acostumbrarnos a, a complejizar los indicadores y arraizarlos en las expectativas de las adolescentes. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I know that Aisa, you have things to say, but I wanted to um, go to the next question, and I will um, definitely prioritize your um, uh, speaking. Um, So in the second big question was, could any of the speakers speak to what a legislative agenda could look like beyond specifying age of marriage? What kinds of things could be included in a legislative agenda that responds to these big challenges that we're laying out? Aisa, would you like to? Oui, oui. Mm -hmm. Oui, je vais m'essayer. Bien, merci, Meg. Euh, concernant l'agenda législatif, vous savez, les, les lois, elles sont euh, bonnes pour pouvoir réguler la vie citoyenne. Pouvoir réguler la vie citoyenne. Pour porter des besoins de, de vote de loi, il faudrait prendre en compte euh, la vie, la vie de la vie des de, de, de principales personnes dont on décide de leur vie. Je pense qu'au au sein de l'agenda législatif, il faudrait qu'il y ait euh, des de, 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 de mesures pour pouvoir prendre encore la consultation participative de ce que passent les jeunes filles elles-mêmes, les, les petites filles, qu'est-ce qu'elles pensent de ce que devrait être leur vie. Euh, je veux prendre pour exemple le, le concours parle du mariage et à la fin de cet exercice-là, 
nous avons été surprises de la façon dont les tout petits, entre 8 et 10 ans, décrivaient leur façon de voir ce que c'est que le mariage. Ces éléments-là devaient faire partie du processus législatif. On devrait vraiment prendre en compte euh, les, les besoins, la parole euh, des, des, des filles elles-mêmes, des principales personnes dont leur vie doit, doit en dépendre des législations. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Uh, would anyone else like to respond to that challenge of what a legislative agenda would look like briefly? And then I'm going to go to, uh, I think, one more question. Yes, Sheena. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge question to try to uh, unpack very briefly. But I think starting out what we need to look at and think about is why the legis legislative agenda, as someone highlighted before, is always punitive um, and how we can perhaps start to think of shifting legislative agendas that are actually building on these concepts of agency. So um, can legislative agendas put in things that we know are, um, are helpful? So, you know, in Pakistan, for example, Education, why isn't every child in school? We have very low enrollment rates, right? Um, so, so those kinds of, so the comprehensive sexuality education programs and information programs that we know are, are helpful. I mean, these are things that I think are those foundational blocks, which um, we know organically result in a lot of the changes that we want to see. And um, instead what we're trying to do in, is go in with these punitive um, kind of measures, which ultimately we know when it comes to, to um, issues of sexual rights, just drive behaviors underground if social norms are not changed. So instead of driving the behaviors underground, we need the legislative reforms to push up um, girls to be able to have economic livelihood, to be able to be educated, to um, build that agency so that we don't really need those laws to play that, that role. Thank you. Um, another very interesting and challenging question, no easy questions from this audience, um, is that for many geographies, political unrest and conflict are compounding factors and are contributing to driving young women into early marriage. So how, in these circumstances of political unrest and conflict, how multidisciplinary or multi-component can interventions really be? You know, how can we bring that kind of um, intervention into settings where uh, conflict makes working so much difficult, so much more difficult? Uh, and, and I would encourage if, if anybody in the, in the audience has um, some thoughts about this, you know, please, um, you know, feel free to respond there as well. Um, I think um, maybe we'll treat that question as a little bit of a, it, we all, we know it's an enormous challenge. We'll, we'll, um, we'll just put the question out there knowing that this is going to be have to be addressed by um, people in the field. Oh, Aisa, yes, because your context is very challenging. Please, um, oui. please, um, please respond. Thank Et you. Si je, merci, Meg. Si j'ai bien compris, euh, la question ce serait comment faire une intervention dans un contexte d'insécurité totale pour mettre fin au mariage d'enfants, par exemple. Mm -hmm. euh, oui, si on parle de, de l'expérience que nous avons ici dans notre contexte, euh, nous avons bâti des stratégies qui consistaient à, à engager la communauté à travers des espaces que nous avons nommés les brigades de dénonciation. Et ces brigades de dénonciation sont constituées essentiellement de la communauté éducative, des personnes qui vivent dans ces, ces endroits insécures. Donc, c'est des personnes qui connaissent le milieu, qui habitent là-bas. Et notre stratégie, c'est de renforcer leur capacité sur des thématiques en lien avec les droits des filles, euh, les violences basées sur le genre, euh, les, les questions de normes de genre 
et de droits humains. Et ces personnes-là, elles deviennent automatiquement celles qui vont prendre le relais pour défendre euh, les filles et pour faire des sensibilisations sur les causes et les conséquences des mariages d'enfants au sein de leur propre communauté. Ce qui fait que même si nous ne pouvons pas atteindre certains espaces, ces personnes qui ont été préalablement formées euh, font ce travail-là et nous restons en connexion pour pouvoir leur apporter euh, des appuis ou des, des formations sur des questions qu'ils qu n'arrivent pas. Et même euh, avec l'avènement de la COVID, nous avons développé une intervention en ligne, ce qui permet que la connexion peut subsister à travers les, les, nouveaux, les, les médias sociaux où les gens peuvent nous joindre pour dénoncer des situations ou bien pour solliciter des appuis. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. I'm conscious that we've arrived. I mean, it's very sad. We've arrived at the end of our time and um, there's just, you know, the people have offered us wonderful questions and comments and been so engaged. Thank you um, to the speakers and thank you to our wonderful audience. Um, if I could just wrap up very briefly, I think it's a very exciting moment in our field where we have the opportunity to bring more nuance to how we conceptualize and measure success in our efforts to delay marriage and mitigate its impacts on the, on the lives of young people. Um, I wanted to mention two upcoming resources. First, that the Sexuality Working Group has been working on a conceptual framework that will very soon be uh, published and disseminated, and also a supplement to the Journal of Adolescent Health um, on child marriage that will be launched on the 16th of February, and you can expect to see some um, events associated with that. So if I, you know, to summarize the, what we were trying to accomplish with the webinar, were we saying that age at marriage should not be an indicator? No but it isn't enough if we care about what is best for girls. And there are a lot of things that can be done to take this forward and to continue to raise these questions in our field. As researchers, we're, um, we need to expand our approach by thinking about um, our, our measures, about marital dynamics, about decision-making and so on, and using new methodologies. Um, as grantees, we can advocate and be in dialogue. I feel, felt very empowered by um, Kathy Hall's remarks to, to engage in dialogue with the donors who fund our work. And donors themselves can be less prescriptive about indicators and encourage grantees to kind of uh, think, to, to have the um, ability to work over longer periods of time and so on. I think we all agree that we owe it to girls to be working toward a fuller vision of what is possible for them, them than simply whether they marry before or after age 18. Thank you so much for your participation today. It was, I, I've learned so much. Um, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Merci infiniment, merci à toi. C'était impeccable. C'est vous tous qui étiez impeccable. <laughs>